Hello and welcome to the Reconstructing Children's Rights Institute's first conversation, confronting colonialism, racism, and patriarchy in international relations and humanitarian aid. This is the first conversation in our multi-part discussion series on racism and power as they affect children and families in settings around the world. I'm Gazelle Keshavarzian and I'll be facilitating the first conversation on behalf of the CPC Learning Network. Before we can really delve deeply into the children's rights space, we thought it's important to first examine the larger ecosystems of international development, humanitarian aid, international relations, fields in which actors working on children's rights and child protection are situated in and embedded in, to better understand the power imbalances that manifest within children's rights structures, we first need to unpack the colonial vestiges and power imbalances intrinsic to these larger contexts. Analysis and critique of the aid industry is critical to understanding international child protection and rights efforts. To help us unpack all of this and launch a series of conversations, we are deeply honored to have two incredibly gifted scholars who have been writing, teaching, and researching on this topic. Dr. Dipali Mukhopadhyay and Dr. Nimi Gorinathan. Dipali is an associate professor in the global policy area at the University of Minnesota's Humphrey School of Public Affairs. Her research focuses on the relationship between political violence, state building, and governance during and after the war. She's currently serving as senior expert on the Afghanistan peace process for the U.S. Institute of Peace. She's a co-author of the forthcoming book, Good Rebel Governance, Revolutionary Politics and Western Intervention in Syria. Nimi is a writer, scholar, and activist. She's a professor at the City College of New York, where she founded the Politics of Sexual Violence Initiative, a global initiative that draws on in-depth research to inform movement building around the impact of sexual violence on women's political identities. As a key part of this initiative, Nimi created Beyond Identity, a gendered platform for scholar activists, a program that seeks to train immigrants and students of color in identity-driven research, political writing, and activism. She's currently a senior scholar at the Center for Political Conflict, Gender, and People's Rights at the University of California, Berkeley. Her forthcoming book, Radicalizing Her, examines the complex politics of the female fighter. Thank you to the two of you for joining us for our first conversation. To start off, as you both know, over the last few months, it's been a time of reflection in regards to inequality and racism in the humanitarian aid world. It's led to debates regarding the colonial legacy and systematic racism within the aid industry, also questioning of the way foreign aid works today. You both have written about and taught in your classes. The recognition of this imbalance of power is nothing new and has deep-rooted historical underpinnings and constructive critique has been taking place for decades in academia and among activists. Can you talk about these historical underpinnings and constructive critiques of the international relations and humanitarian aid sectors? How have they informed your work as researchers, teachers, and activists? We'll first pass it on to you, Dipali. Welcome. Thank you so much, Hazel. I'm so happy to be here with you in conversation with you and with Nimi, um, and to be back at Columbia, uh, where I taught for many years, it's really a pleasure to be part of this very important conversation. I think for me, um, I start by thinking about my own experience as a student of international relations. I was very moved um, by this humanitarian imperative that took hold in the mid-90s. After the end of the Cold War, the Security Council of the United Nations, the deadlock that it had lived in as a function of the, the Cold War eased, and the possibility for multilateral intervention became an option really for the first time in modern history. And during that time, this idea of human security emerged, which was this notion that the plights and the well being of ordinary people in far off places were of consequences to those in the West, and that it was the obligation of the privilege to address injustice and suffering to do something. Right? And there was a kind of exuberance about all that was possible and all that was necessary that really I think I got quite swept up in as a young person. And by 2005, that ambient sense um, 
was coming into coherence into a kind of doctrine or a norm that we call the responsibility to protect, which basically meant that even if the United Nations did not authorize the use of force, if humanitarian atrocities were underway, if civil wars were spiraling out of control, if there was evidence of a genocidal campaign, that states, governments were not only permitted, but in fact, they were obligated to take action on behalf of civilians under threat. And for me, most of our contemporary conceptions of humanitarian action, whether it's advocacy around women's rights, children's rights, minority rights, all the way to forms of military intervention that produce regime change, all of those types of action are kind of flowing from this notion of a responsibility to protect. And so I think it's useful to unpack that norm a little bit by putting it into a bigger theoretical and historical context. So the idea that some states, some advocates, some organizations have the right and obligation to interfere in the affairs of other states is actually a very radical idea. We have states was built on the notion that at base, all states are sovereign. Meaning what goes on within their borders is only of concern to them. And except in cases of self-defense, other states do not have the right to intervene in their internal affairs. What the norm of the responsibility to protect and the interventions in Somalia, in Bosnia, in Kosovo that preceded it, in Libya and Syria that have come after, what it basically does is it makes that concept of sovereignty supple and contingent and relative rather than absolute. And the theoretical justification for that shift whereby some states are sovereign, like the United States, and others are not, is anchored in ideas of liberalism. And those ideas of liberalism we can trace back to the imperial project and the colonial project. It's very, uh, it's a real paradox, right? Because the, the, this is a long standing set of ideas that sanctify the rights and liberties of individuals. And more recently, that has meant this near axiomatic belief in the communities in which we circulate that everyone in the world deserves to enjoy freedom and the possibilities that come with democracy. And as somebody who's been studying Afghanistan for two decades and studying Syria for one, I can tell you it's hard to argue with that idea, right, on its face, because I know countless Afghans and Syrians who have put their lives on the line and in some cases lost them um, for the chance to live with the rights and freedoms that we enjoy. What I think becomes more complex and what's the importance of this conversation is what are the roles of outsiders, right, in these struggles? And how does it happen that the imperative to give people these rights and freedoms can actually produce a very perverse set of outcomes? Because our conception of what is good for them may not actually align with their own conceptions when they go into the ballot box and vote for a particular political party, or they decide how they want to draft their family law provisions in their new constitution, or what kind of violence they deem to be legitimate or not. And in the end, the truth is that the most powerful states in the world rarely take actions or make investments based on what the people in those communities actually want and believe, right? They are there for their own set of reasons and motivations. So I think you may be reading Laila Abulugod's work, which has influenced the work of, of um, me and of Nimi as well. You know, she argued in the Afghan case that the wish to save Afghan women animated American intervention, but so too really did the wish to exact vengeance on those who committed the attacks on 9-11. And so if warlord commanders with records of abuse were prepared to take up arms against the Taliban, then the rights of women can wait for another day. And so I'll just close by saying that for me, the work of scholars,
that has made clear these linkages between liberalism and imperialism, like Uday Mehta, who basically argues that those who sought to liberate saw subjugation of, of, for an indefinite period of time, ironically, as the way to ultimately raise up liberal citizens, right, in countries like India when they colonize them. In the contemporary space, Nimi Garinathan's work has, for me, really served the purpose of complicating concepts like empowerment by pushing my own thinking into a space of really asking, are these actions on the part of international actors for the good? Do they actually do good? And that means we have to interrogate what does good mean i'm sure we're going to get into into this more in terms of these other critical approaches but that that's sort of the context where i would start great no that's fascinating and it's it, it resonates so much with kind of our reflections um nimi i'll pass it on to you and particularly and dipali teed you up but also just in terms of the context of humanitarian aid as well i'm so happy to be here with with you all and with my comrade um, Dipali in this sort of liminal academic space we <laughs> occupy politically. Um, you know, in my work, uh, intellectually has been primarily the study of the female fighter, the Tamil Tigers in Sri Lanka. Um, but uh, as I was doing this work, I was also an aid worker in the humanitarian world um, for about 10 years. So, you know, a lot of my perspective is informed from a critique of, of acting and thinking in multiple spaces. You know, in my study of the female fighter, and I think my time in the aid world and the policy world, it's sort of this overlap of the colonial underpinnings of a version of, of white feminism that I come up against most starkly, right? And so that kind of, like the Venn diagram of the two, which, you know, one could argue completely overlap at times, but it's really there that, that structurally my work um, faces barriers, right? Uh, this can be, you know, manifest in a lot of ways, but for me, primarily in this kind of hypocrisy of power. You know, when you talk about the child rights based issues like child soldiers, where you have this moral indignation at the supposed brainwashing of children, right? Um, like the ISIS recruit in the UK, Shamima Begum, you know, and that kind of particular Western disdain for the militarization of children with little acknowledgement that the U.S. regularly recruits children into the military at the age of 15, which was the age at which Shamima joined or, or tried to join um, ISIS. And then sort of further, uh, you know, into this, digging into this kind of um, uh, hypocrisy that based on power in the global north is how this gets siloed into gender spaces, right? And how is the girl child constructed and celebrated in ways that disconnect her from both community networks and cultural lives, right? And we see this process of, of talking, we talk about depoliticizing, but this process beginning quite young, right, um, with these young women. Um, and as Dipali was talking about this notion of sort of exporting various ideologies, right, of democracy, of peacefulness, how does this map onto women in those spaces? How do we, you know, how are we unable to see women's distinctive politics that don't ally with our interests, with U.S. interests, right? The women who are violent, the women who engage in violence as political action, um, our inability to see them, I sort of find, as, as both anti-feminist um, and ineffective. And again, it comes from this sort of intersection of our, our stated adherence to nonviolence and in the resistance and an inability to grapple with the distinctive politics of women that we don't agree with, right? You know, to me, in the in this sort of girls' rights space in particular, you see this the depoliticizing of, of a child in general being compounded um, a bit. Yeah, I mean, you know, we've had cases of with the female fighter, let's say in Sri Lanka, you have these white feminist scholars who have gone to interview women in the Tigers who will say, "Well, these women are wearing fatigues and they have no earrings and." They're not allowed to be feminine. You know, an exact quote would be that, you know, they see this as a perverse form of empowerment, right? And so it's a very complicated um, convolutions that the white feminist does in these contexts and in determining what empowerment should look like, right? A kind of traditionalist feminine empowerment to see their, 
to see their politics. Um, and even I think this emphasis on the idea of girls' leadership, you know, girls taking leadership, it's very individualized, right? It's about an individual girl. And it's most often linked to sexual liberation or the victimhood of violence, right? It's someone like Malala, um, that that woman gets sort of a platform on the basis of the sort of horrific violence that she faces, rather than existing inside of the community and the collective from which she has probably always been been activating. You know? So you have this kind of idea of, you know, a woman as, in particular, a child as a victim or a superhero, right? And those are the two things that she can be and nothing in between. And, and primarily the research that the Pali was speaking to and empowerment and others, my concern remains that when you construct a woman or a child as a sexualized victim, you're not able to see her as a political actor. Right? You don't expect political action from this from this figure. No? And, you know, so a lot of these, particularly in the direct interventions, you know, I've worked in Pakistan and Sri Lanka and other spaces, you have this, you know, confusion of culture with context also. And this is another way that white feminism shows up is that, well, you know, girls are not supposed to be educated in Pakistan. Right. And that that's, you know, as soon as there was a Pakistan earthquake, I think a decade ago, every donor I spoke to wanted to build a girl's school. Right? And we were in this moment of like needing food and water and they wanted to build a girl's school. And really, you know, when you do this kind of more thoughtful research, you find that, yes, there's some fathers who don't want their children going to school. But there's others who don't send the girls to school because there's a U.S. military checkpoint there and there's stories of girls being raped at various checkpoints, right? And that is the context which we have some control over. We don't have the ability to intervene on gender norms culturally, right, in any of these spaces, right? We shouldn't have the ability to. The UN should not have the ability to, right? Um, but the context can be shifted, isn't it? So this sort of fallback on culture, which allows everybody a way out of accountability, well, it's just culture, it's a static culture, you know, without acknowledging that it wraps around context. Um, in my book, I talk a little bit about this idea of marriage, and of course, in the girls' rights world, early marriage is a big, big thing. And there's a book that's very good, a novel called The Story of a Brief Marriage, and a video that came out from Channel 4 at the end of the war, which I found very impactful, but it was a young girl who was clearly a soldier because she had cut her hair very short, a combatant, a guerrilla combatant. And as the army truck came, you saw the aunties putting a red dot on her forehead and putting a gold necklace on her to try and show very quickly that she was married in order to protect her from being taken from the military, right? And so how does one reconcile this sort of blanket imperative to protect her from early marriage when the protection needs to operate on so many different levels? Right for her, um, you can see this child with tears and you know trying to explain that she's married and so they wouldn't take her. So I just sort of you know I think this is really it's an important conversation because it's raised so many questions for me. You know, like in thinking about this and the questions you asked me to think about, but particularly around and we can talk about this now or later. But I would like to get into the question of of what it means when you say that you depoliticize a child, right? Where at what stage their consciousness emerges, at what stage context becomes relevant, right? Um, so I'll leave it there, but I think I would like to come back to the question of, of political consciousness in children. I think you both, I mean, you both shared so much and it's it touches on so many issues that I think that the sector hasn't necessarily talked about. Um, so you're opening the door to so many um, more reflections, but also critiques. And maybe we, we can go back to that issue of um, politics and, and the child, I agree. Um, I and mean, we're building on that discussion. If the whole construct of the discipline of international relations and humanitarian aid is built on colonialism and racism, why don't we engage efforts to redress power and promote social justice in a way that is feminist and anti-racist? What are the barriers that continue to exist um, to prevent this proactive recognition and dismantling? Um, and what's at stake if we continue to dismiss all of these building blocks? I mean, I think for me, the institutional landscape tells us a lot about why these issues persist. If you look at institutions of higher learning, if you look at institutions of philanthropy, of policymaking, 
I mean, bluntly, they are occupied by people who remain invested in the status quo. And as a number of scholars from the Global South have noted, that ends up meaning that the West becomes a stand-in for what is good, for what is general, for what is appropriate, for what is normal. It becomes the norm rather than just another collection of countries that are sites of complex politics, of violence, of misogyny and racism. And for me, I mean, one of the benefits of the Trump era, and it's hard to find many of them, but I think one of the benefits is that scholars of American politics can no longer cling to this unspoken sense of American exceptionalism that has animated a lot of our understanding about these concepts. And frankly, neither can donors anymore. I mean, who are Western donors at this point to be telling others how to protect children, you know, when there are cages on the border that are housing them between the United States and Mexico, or how to promote democracy and the rights of minorities when we have a white nationalist insurrection in the capital. I think, you know, for me, the challenge of redressing the power imbalance is particularly difficult when people believe that they are doing good, right? And that comes back, I think, to my initial comments and then Nimi's comments, you know, doing good doesn't feel like imperialism, um, but that doesn't mean that it isn't anchored in many of the same logics and the same tools. And there's a certain self-righteousness, certainly in American foreign policy making, that comes with doing good that is incredible. It is bipartisan. It's one of the few things on which Republicans and Democrats can agree. And it's invulnerable to critique and to consequence, even in the face of catastrophic outcomes. I mean, for me, one of the striking examples of this is the Libya intervention in 2011. And the enormous focus in the political, in the public political space about what happened to those four people, four American diplomats who were killed in Benghazi, who knew exactly what they were doing and made decisions and took on risks. And yet that became the center of gravity for the controversy. When the real catastrophe and the real controversy is the military intervention that the Obama administration, along with several European governments, enacted without any real seeming regard for what would come next and for the absolute multifold catastrophe that has unfolded over the last decade in Libya. And when you look at it just from, a, from an institutional perspective, none of the people who advocated on behalf of that intervention have been pushed to the margins of the conversation. The same can be said about the Iraq war, right? Samantha Power is going to be the head of USAID. You know, I think she's one of the people who was responsible from the time she was an advocate through the period when she assumed power. And her explanation is how could we, we didn't understand the culture and the context. I'm paraphrasing, but I actually think it's incredibly close to the language that Nimi used. I mean, anybody could have understood who had any semblance of an understanding of the history of the state in Libya, of the region, of other comparable interventions. Most of all her, she wrote a whole book about the flaws of those types of interventions. But the consequences and the kind of cleaning of house and the reckoning doesn't happen in these institutions, in the academy, in the policy making space, in the philanthropic space, from what I can see. And I think that's why we're still having this conversation, even though we've known these problems have been really ubiquitous from the very beginning of these enterprises. There's a, a magazine that I published that the Pali is on the board of called Adi Magazine. It's a policy magazine that's intended to kind of rehumanize policy with some of these overtly political questions. And we've just um, released our sixth issue called White Deeds um, that really looks at whiteness in the policy world and also the overlap in the aid world. Um, and the goal was to, from a foundational level, see US policy as resting on whiteness as a kind of epistemology, like a way of seeing, knowing, valuing, 
that guides American power and contorts the lives that it touches and especially outside its own national boundaries. So, you know, the interest was not in this kind of overt, um, very clear whiteness, you know, that shows up on the cap steps of the Capitol building. But um, in this moment of sort of multiple reckonings, it's the unseen, the unarticulated, the sort of maneuvers of whiteness that we've all felt in our work, you know, in the spaces that we work. Um, and, you know, we interviewed folks like Dr. Kanisha Bond, who, who said, you know, it's a hard thing to square that whiteness might not be malicious, but it is insidious, right? It is, it's not intended to hurt you, but it absolutely will, right? And I find that this becomes a sticking point in any conversation on race that we've had conferences on refugees and others that I've organized um, where the question, there's this fallback on what Depali raised on the question of intent, right? That this is with good intent, that this is with good intentions, which again goes back to the justification of particularly um, interventions on gender with morality, right? That this is a moral moral obligation. And again, that falls very heavily on women. But this then, you know, the fallback on intent again releases accountability of a certain sort, right? It shuts down political conversation because if I challenge you, I'm not challenging your politics. I'm saying that you're a bad person, right? And so that you cannot have a discussion past that, right? So for me, the question of intent is irrelevant. And even the how whiteness presents, um, we had a Kenyan scholar who talked about, Kenyan writer, Christine Mongai, who talked about a whiteness conference that she attended in Kenya. She said, in Kenya, whiteness remains an organizing philosophy, an epistemological tool and a way of being in the world normalized so thoroughly as to not need white bodies to enact it. Black bodies do the work just as effectively. For me, a lot of the work at this moment, and particularly in my current research, was really anchored in how do we excavate for whiteness, right? Um, where do we, where are we not looking for it in some of this work, right? So the role of children, again, becomes for me a bit of a cover for the acts of, of white supremacy. Um, but it, the role of children can directly extend the sort of work of white supremacy, right? In terms of the programming that happens around it, there's a new project I'm working on at the border with um, my good friend and, and scholar and writer, Valeria Luiselli, on the hysterectomies and reproductive violence that's happening at the borders of the United States. Um, it has been happening. You know, since 1940s to women of color, to immigrants. And this um, work is, of course, tied to children, but inextricably linked to the question of, of motherhood and the question of choice. And what we're essentially, you know, trying to do is to recode this from this sort of what, you know, my friend Kate and I call this pink ghetto of sexual violence into political violence, right? To read this work as a work of white supremacy, as the work of, of eugenics, right? When you're sterilizing women who are entering this country, when you're not allowing a child to be born, when you have, I was just at the barn in San Diego, when you have CBP officers in hospital delivery rooms, you know, pushing doctors to make decisions whether or not a child is born in this country so the mother has a greater right to citizenship, you know, pushing them back across the border. Children are very much tied then to the work of white supremacy, isn't it? Um, and these sort of overlapping forces of, of militarization, right? Um, and so this kind of the deeper, deeper whiteness happening through, you know, our understanding of, of motherhood and what it is to reproduce race in different ways. I have another essay coming out in the LA Review of Books about white nationalist women in a few weeks. And it is it's a fascinating book called Sisters in Hate um, that goes into this great detail that women of color would never be offered, but about the threat to their children of of the white race, you know, being eliminated um, and how they sort of see their political work as tied to this threat to their children, right? Um, so I think that, you know, in all these spaces that, that whiteness is operating, there is the institutional level and there are things that, you know, we can and I think we will talk about how it operates in a more, you know, transactional or a more bureaucratic way. But in terms of tracing whiteness, I, you know, sort of fear that we're still operating at a very superficial level and we're not able to see how it's digging its roots into different kinds of language, of ideology, of, 
of social movement building, right? Um, of resistance, of, of identity politics that is going to be increasingly dangerous, um, both here and abroad. Great. Now, this has been really fascinating. Before I move on to the next set of questions, I just wanted to touch on, and this goes to your point earlier, Nimi, about the kind of the politics of children, but also to what you were talking about. And also, to Polly, what you're talking about in terms of good and bad and who decides who is good and bad. But, you know, within children's rights, you know, there's increased recognition that children's rights are weaponized, you know, whether it's by the far right or, you know, in terms of, you know, morality within a community, children are used in different ways. And it can be used by the left or right, um, by different groups. But, you know, those who work in the child rights or child protection space, um, such as myself, you know, the work is always rooted in kind of charity. Like, we're there to help children. We're there to help families. We're coming in to care and protect for those who are vulnerable and needy. But increasingly, I've seen this in my work and kind of my discomfort in the work is that children are not do not live in a vacuum. They're surrounded by this political economy and by these oppressions. And, you know, they're kind of pushed around within that system. You know, how do we bring the politics in some in children's rights? You know, how do we shift the conversations? And that kind of goes to both of what you have been talking about. So it'd be great to get both of your thoughts. I don't know if maybe Nimi can go first and then to Polly. Yeah, it's something that I was I was thinking about a lot in terms of this this conversation. Um, you know, I think maybe the first is is a question of of categorizing who is a child um, and and who isn't. You know, I speak of the female fighters interviewed in my book who were largely sixteen to eighteen um, when they fought um, as women, primarily sort of in recognition of the conditions that have forced them into adulthood or into a role associated with womanhood, right? A condition is experienced by so many children, right? Um, and of course, you would need a need a you know child psychologist to to fully unravel this. But from my perspective, I think some of the important questions are are how are the stages of their development impacted, stunted, accelerated by experiences of violence, right? And how does that shape how we categorize them? And at what point, and this is really, you know, a question I don't have an answer to, but at what point is a distinctive political emerging, political identity emerging for them, right? Political consciousness and sort of separately, but equally important, at what point can we put the, place the burden of representation onto this identity, right? To steer interventions when you say like child-centered or child right centered or right? Even in the field of women, and I hesitate too much to... <laughs> to conflate the two or draw them too close together. But you do find often when I'm particularly when I talk to students, well, you know, who are trying to avoid the trap of of an overbearing humanitarian to, you know, well, what's the most effective intervention? If you push them, they'll say, well, you find this woman who's the most vulnerable, right? Whatever that means, you know, affected by the tsunami and caste and poor and all of these things, right? And so let's say you find this, you know, impossibly vulnerable woman, then what do you do then? And they say, well, you ask her what she wants, right? And that's quite a huge, huge burden to place, um, you know, on a woman who's in that context, but also doesn't even allow for the possibility of, of shifting perspectives over time, right? That her politics may change, what she wants may change. Um, and that becomes, I think, again, not, not necessarily conflating the two, but that becomes more pronounced in children, right? Because of the developmental stage they're at. So I think maybe it's a little bit more useful to think of the ways in which intervention can disrupt the natural trajectory of political consciousness, right? You know, I've worked in, particularly in post-disaster environments, and I think in disaster you get this kind of, you know, more so than not thought through chaos of humanitarianism presents itself, right? Because it's this immediate sort of reaction to stuff. Um, and I remember being in Sri Lanka with groups of play therapists from America Korean churches and Scientologists, you know, all engaging with children in these very disturbing, disturbing ways. And of course, also providing food and whatever else, you know, 
And to me, that kind of intervention into a child's life and and the more long-term ones than particularly, let's say, the Catholic Church, which took over a lot of the spaces in Sri Lanka during the war and a lot of the orphanages, um, can play this role of a kind of dulling or redirecting of political sensibilities of these children, right? Because they're never allowed to be political or engaged in those conversations. Um, And I think like, Polly pointed out there is this application of a kind of universality of rights um, that has this embedded collective blessing because you're talking about children, right? So it can be uninterrogated. Um, when it applies to children who are seen only through the lens of protection, right, then there has to be, of course, a blanket standard for understanding them. So I think for me, the question really is where do we place what can often be these clear articulations of political perspectives from children or even their emerging positions on morality, right? Children have a kind of clarity on this is right and this is wrong without overstating agency or unfairly overburdening a child with that, right? And sometimes I think this politicization is attributed to parents, but it's not it's not really been my experience, particularly in conflict zones, that parents are having these long conversations with children to politicize them. It's more their direct visceral tie to the violence that's affected them. Um, you know, there was a child I met last year, the year before, in Cox's Bazaar, Rohingya child, who was explaining to me who set the fires and why, at the age of 12, he needed a national verification card or nobody would believe he was from Myanmar, you know, or a Tamil child in Sri Lanka whose land was freed by the military but still restricted, who like leaned over and picked up the soil and said, you know, this is my land, this is the Tamil homeland, right? It's very difficult to believe that these children were were brainwashed or were, you know. Um, but again, you know, how do you both recognize that, that that exists and not sort of um, force it to be crystallized for these children and not allow them to shift and grow over time, right? And not disrupt that trajectory. Um, and that's something that, you know, there's not an easy answer to that. No, there's not an easy answer, but this was um, really important kind of reflections and reflections that we really haven't had that much in the, in the child rights space. To Polly, it'd be great to get your thoughts too. Yeah, I mean, I think it's fascinating because in the, initially when... I thought about this conversation, I thought, well, you know, I don't work in in the space of child protection. Will there be lessons from my own work that will be relevant? And the more that I've talked about this with you, Gazelle, the more that I realize how endemic these kind of frameworks are. So I think, you know, as Nimi just explained, the the construction of vulnerability is is a is a construction with which Western interveners are very comfortable. And that the idea that there are those out there who need to be protected, who need to be saved, often from their own cultures, their own families. Um, there, you know, that idea has has existed vis-a-vis adults, um, you know, who are brown and black. Um, for centuries, and I can only imagine how much more difficult it would be to dismantle it for children who in fact do have obvious vulnerabilities and for which I would imagine that framing can be left uninterrogated without a lot of trouble and without a lot of resistance. I mean, in my own work, I noticed that members of the Syrian opposition who had made decisions that involved cal- complex calculations, complex political considerations, enormous risk and courage, enormous acts of, you know, collective kind of cooperation and communal care, that they could be reduced to those who need to be saved those who need to be taught how to be Democrats, those who need to be shown how to govern themselves, that that could be done to, act. I mean, we're talking like, you know, middle-aged adults here who have literally taken their, their fate and the fate of their country into their own hands, the ease with which donors could engage them in terms that were infantilizing. And, and you know, I think we, 
Kim Howe, my co-author, and I have thought about that as infantilizing. And then to think about child protection, it became clear to me how relevant this analog was. I think agency is dangerous um, for those who believe they're doing charitable work because you are the agent, you know, as an, as an intervener in a charity framework. You are the one who comes with, you do what you want to do, what works for you, what you know, what will look successful to you, what will make you feel good. And the other is just an object of your intervention and your good deeds. And I think that's how, you know, as Nimi has put it in our other work, like saving can become oppressive. Um, and even acts that are framed as empowering can actually be strip people of their agency. And ultimately what agency means is, is politics, right? And power. We're talking about politics and we're talking about power. And to think about children as agents in their own lives, I think for those of us who, you know, and intuitively that's a very difficult reach, I think for many people. And these frameworks and these institutions and these landscapes are built so that we never have to confront that fact. And I think there some, could be some really interesting learning to happen between those who critique this broader sort of collection of interventions and the particulars of child protection, because I don't think it's exclusive at all to the child protection space. It feels very familiar to me from other forms of intervention. No, this is so true. And I think this conversation just shows that we need to like come out of our little bubbles and speak to each other because it's both of what you're saying is just it resonates so much with the work that we do, but also thinking about how we can reconstruct the space as well as we kind of move ahead with these conversations in the coming weeks and months and possibly years. One of our concerns is, you know, how do we push the discussions from another top-down, technocratic, kind of quick fix exercise of you know, high-level access consultations, working groups, to an actual actionable discussion about structural dismantling and devolving of power and resources. You know, how can we do that? I know this is something you both have explored in your scholarship, so I'll pass it on to you. You know, having taught under you know, the Pali asked me to at SIPA with policy students at Columbia. Um, you know, one of the things that you see taking hold even pedagogically very early on in people who are going to intervene is, you know, I think you all have read the, the essay that's coming out in the Save the Children collection, but about the neoliberal world order, but the importance of order to thinking, right? The importance of linear thinking, um, measurements, everything that can provide, particularly the West and a Western liberal sensibility, a sense of, of power and security and power, right? And so all of these things, you know, the students struggle with this idea when the first and many in the policy world with, you know, what is the solution to this? What are what are the recommendations? What are, right? Rather than sort of being able to, um, like the paper DePaul was referring to, Emissaries of Empowerment, which talked about the depoliticizing nature of empowerment programming through white feminism, um, which I suppose is speaking to, you know, the ineffectiveness of them, right? But the purpose of the paper was to reveal a complicity, right, in colonial structures. And what you found is the reaction predominantly from white feminists was, you're right, these programs are not working, what should we do? But a complete inability to sit and grapple with the depoliticizing nature of the programming, right, and to acknowledge that. I remember being at a donor conference recently that we're working on girl, girl children and a collection of donors. And when I gave a lecture, somebody said, um, don't you think you're preaching to the choir, which is immediately sort of off-putting because that would mean I was like them <laughs> and all that. But, um, but beyond that, you know, the reality is that a choir is a performance, you know, and it's quite easy to perform if you've been taught the right words. So yes, you're all saying, you know, all of the right language and capacity building and all this other stuff, right? 
But if you were doing political work, it shouldn't be a choir. It shouldn't be in unison. There should be fractures. There should be disagreements, right? There should be productive disagreements, right? But because you're operating at the level of the performative, which is what I see most of what's happening, you know, in this you know realm right now around whiteness, is a very performative reaction to to the accusations, right? I mean, as you know, the word that Paula used earlier, the question of reckoning becomes subverted with this constant white apology or, or police thing, or, right? It, in itself, this kind of practice for me um, absolves everybody of an actual reckoning with structures, right? Um, you know, there are many things I think like at the institutional level for me, I find, you know, beyond, of course, the representation of people of color, um, the language has to be challenged, right? And where this language is coming from, and it's something that I, you know, every report I've written in this world or analysis or the language becomes very fraught, right? In a report for the Asian Development Bank on gender and voice, political voice in South Asia, I was told to take out the word identity and replace it with marker, right? <laughs> in itself is such a is such a political act for me to do that right but these are things that people allow to to happen without seeing that each of these is chipping away at at the politics of what's going on here you know language like localization or grassroots right without acknowledging the deep infiltration of the aid world already, you know, kind of at a collective level, what I was talking about with the individual woman, this assumption of this untouched purity of political life in some village in Kashmir, you know, like a pool to draw from that hasn't already been infiltrated by this very powerful aid world, right? I mean, you can go really to any village anywhere in the world and ask women what it is they'd like to do. And they'll say, capacity building or we want to do empowerment or we want to do right so localization and grassroots means very little in that context right and of course you know empowerment which to me ranges from intellectual laziness to complete complicity in structures and hierarchy of, of whiteness and white feminism um and actors in this space you know may just operate out of laziness right to the status quo but I think, you know, recently I was reading something about repetition, I think, with white nationalists as a key to propaganda and extremism. They often say repetition, repetition is something that, because in these like untethered minds, repetition becomes something that convinces people to do stuff. But it's actually something I've seen the most inside the aid world. It's a constant repetition of, of terms, of language, of approaches. And nobody really looks at what impact that has on the psyche of those operating inside these spaces, right? So, you know, and without sort of getting into solutions, I can say that, you know, there are, you know, my interest is, again, is not in pushing back against these very rigid institutions. It's in expanding the political imagination of resistance. And you do see that happening, right? There are shifting alliances. There are global South connections happening outside of, outside of the West. You do see a kind of a new form of rebellion. Um, for me, that's important to be able to cultivate that rebellion amongst people who are receiving money, um, cultivating a conscious resistance. We had a meeting with young nationalist women in Myanmar that same summer, and it was sort of fascinating that they felt they couldn't challenge donors, right? They would ask questions like, why is nationalist a bad word? Without sort of recognizing that the donors need them to get the funding. Right. And so, of course, you can challenge them. Right. Um, and starting to recognize amongst this grantee population that rebellion is part of your political work against the forces that are funding. you. Know? So I think in these spaces, you know, the bigger question of creating global south alliances, but also in that kind of micro level of, of pushing local organizations to resist the donors themselves. I think there I have seen very positive sort of political possibilities there. Right. That's fascinating. And I think it's so true. I think we need to cultivate more rebellion for sure. Dipali, it would be great to get your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, it's funny. I should have guessed that Nimi and I would have very similar answers to this question. I, I always think of her as kind of my rebel leader. <laughs> my, 
insurgent teachers. So, you know, we both have had this experience for, for many years now of teaching in policy schools. And our job, at least theoretically, is to professionalize young people to become policymakers and implementers and diplomats and aid workers, etc. And one of the things I think we together learned quite early was how uncomfortable our students, but also our colleagues were with the notion of dis with discomfort. <laughs> that realization came to me pretty early. And I think my pedagogical philosophy, if anything, is to just produce intense, sustained discomfort among my students. In this context, I think what that really means is sitting in the discomfort of our failure and of the harms that we have produced when we thought we were doing good. And, you know, I'll just give you an example. I teach, I show my students the, some of you will remember this Coney 2012 campaign right, which was these the three young men from the U.S. who launched this crusade to stop the recruitment of child soldiers in Uganda in the Lord's Resistance Army. And the campaign was, I think, the, f the first truly viral video on YouTube. Um, and it got the attention of the Obama White House. It got the attention of the International Criminal Court. And the reason that I teach it is that I talk to my students, I show it to them, and then we talk about the fact that when I watched this film, I already had a PhD. I was actually a professor already at Columbia when the film came out. Having read for a decade and taught about the complexities of humanitarian intervention, all the things we've been talking about this afternoon. And yet when I watched this film, I found myself really moved by, I can still remember the boy's name was Jacob, this, this child soldier. I think I signed a bunch of petitions. I probably gave money, having no idea where this money was going to go. I did not do my homework about the Lord's Resistance Army. I did not understand the ways in which the Museveni government in Uganda would weaponize this cause to their own authoritarian ends. I did not understand the fact that a call for action would result in the mobilization of U.S. special forces. And I should have known better, but when I watched this film of these young children sleeping in the, you know, in the city center, I mean, it's not even a city, the town center for fear of being kidnapped, it did the emotional work of making me feel I should do something, maybe making me feel I could do something, and then the satisfaction of having done something that was really, a, a, on the one hand, complete insignificance to the actual plight of these children, and on the other hand, of great significance as becoming part of the herd mentality. And... I teach that because I want them, I want my students to know that like at some point in time we were, we have all been, even the loudest critics have all been complicit <laughs> in feeling like our power, our privilege, our resources, our intellect, whatever it is, Ha, are put us in a position to make radical change when we actually don't know what we're doing. Every time Nimi has come to one of my classes, inevitably one student will raise his, it's usually a he, will raise his hand and say, you know, this is just, this is so negative and I want to just, I, I really feel like you're not offering me like a constructive alternative here and there's so many problems in the world and surely we should be doing something about it. And, you know, Nimi has taught me how to just sit there <laughs> and absorb, allow for that discomfort to just kind of take over the room. And I've had many, many students over the years who've told me, like, they leave my classes just feeling, like, sad <laughs> and alarmed and at, at, at odds sort of feeling a real tension about whether they've 
they should go back to being in the military or go join the foreign service or not, whether they should actually go to save the children and work there. And they came in just feeling in a, tr a tremendous sense of confidence that they have something to offer and there is something to be done. And they do have something to offer and there is something to be done. But I think the way to begin to really dismantle some of this is to just really sit with how unbelievably bad we as a collective have been at thinking about these questions, at addressing these problems and challenges, and most fundamentally at not taking responsibility for our part in creating, you know, what Nimi called the context. Because at every step of the way, I mean, if you study a place like Afghanistan, like I do, you have 20 years of evidence of every single thing that looks like a problem to a policymaker in 2021, can be traced back to some idiotic, irresponsible, unethical decision that was probably made by an American 10 years ago, 15 years ago, two years ago. That feels much less mobilizing. It feels less inspiring than thinking there are problems out there and we can solve them. Rather than thinking we, we bring a lot of problems to wherever we go. And perhaps, I think the way of thinking about that is that perhaps the solutions lie elsewhere and not with us. And I think that's really difficult to wrap your head around because that means some of us are going to be out of work, <laughs> right? It means some of us don't, aren't going to have ways to raise money, aren't going to have ways to make a livelihood, aren't going to have books to write about, whatever it may be. But I think until we have that reckoning, that the dismantling doesn't really begin. Oh, I mean, that's so great. And I think it's, you know, going on to your point that solutions are elsewhere. And this is the last question in this conversation that I think we could have hours discussing. But you know, now that there are these renewed discussions regarding the future of foreign aid, whose vision and framings should we be privileging in that reimagination? And how do we ensure they are privileged moving forward? I'll just say in my own work, you know, whether it's research or policy advocacy or teaching, I'm thinking a lot about whose voices are getting centered and in what ways. And so I think we tend to think of those we study or those we, you know, intervene upon, as it were, as objects of our knowledge, our agenda, our charity, our support. And instead, I think we need to start thinking about them as our teachers, first and foremost. And then maybe we earn the right to be their partners, right? <laughs> But let's really fully flip it first. Invariably, whether it's a, it's a Tamil Sri Lankan child that Nimi was talking about all the way to, you know, a six-year-old member of the Syrian opposition or... Um, an Afghan female journalist, they, invari they invariably know more than we do about their own circumstance and their levels of equity and, and investment and the fact that they have to live with the consequences of whatever actions are taken. That for me needs to be the starting proposition. And it's time that I think we acknowledge then we've been working in their worlds without adequate permission and without adequate understanding. And that can feel, I think, very paralyzing. But part of what I've realized is every decision we make about who we hire, who we publish, whose work we assign on a syllabus, whose projects we fund, every single one of those decisions is a political act that holds the possibility of reapportioning power and privilege in new terms and re and doing the work of as you put it redress right it's really interesting to me and again i mean nimi and i'll give a shout out to another colleague and and friend of ours roxani cristali taught me this in a very stark way mostly by helping me to understand my own complicity in not 
being willing to engage in acts of rebellion myself. And the fact is those acts of rebellion may cost you your job, but they are deeply satisfying in the long term in terms of realizing how instantly a conversation can change if the syllabus in your classroom is majority female scholars, one third scholars of color, one third scholars from the global south. I didn't have the, the awareness and the politics to even question those curricula, question the, the composition of the room of every academic institution I've ever been in, of the Defense Department when I worked there, of the U.S. Institute of Peace, wherever it may be. I was just really thrilled to be in the room. What people like Mimi taught me was being in the room is the beginning, right? Being in the room is not the end. It's the beginning then of the work. It's quite remarkable how rooms can change if you're prepared to, to I think, do that kind of work. And for me, that really is centering the voices of those who have been at the margins despite having known more all this time. And it's not actually that hard to do. You just have to be prepared to put your own equities on the line because part of what it means is you're giving up some of your space for, for somebody else, right? And that that has been the joy of being part of the of Andy magazine. Like that has been for me um, the joy about thinking differently about how I collaborate with my Afghan partner, scholarly partners on the ground, my interlocutors, how I think about every conversation about Afghan policy now at the highest levels in Washington that I get to have, I can every single time bring somebody else into the room, put something in front of somebody to read, that it, the content of the conversation changes and then the outcome I think will follow. So for me, that's a very um, kind of emboldening set of possibilities that open up from that. Thank you. And on to you, Nimi. <laughs> Yeah, that's, I mean, I think it's important that the poly ends with a, with both of us end with an honest reflection, you know, what this has been to us personally, what it's been to our students. I think it's maybe most useful to, you know, if I share a debate, let's say, I had with the publishing house of my book about radicalizing her. And it sort of reveals to me why I place so much emphasis on the global north on the west to take the burden of this rather than this constant looking for sources to give us the answers you know of, of who we can center in the global south right because the reality is um the way that they're going to be centered is is not going to shift things politically right but also you know when you talk about rebellion um there's i'll read this short short piece from the the essay that I shared with you all that will be in the Save the Children book, but you know, it's, it talks about a local NGO that worked with the tigers in Sri Lanka um, that I was very close to, and this moment in their political consciousness, right, where, and I'll quote this, those who work from the inside to alleviate suffering see with clarity that need is created by state violence. They would begin to rebel, and that every realizing that every modicum of performed moderation was a concession to their own substatus in the naturalized order of the world, right? And that all of, of what they had done to seem to be effective and apolitical to donors and everybody else, right? As soon as they resisted a little bit, right? So again, when you're talking about cultivating that rebellion, they were shut down as having ties to terrorism. Right, and being a terrorist organization, right? And similarly with the young man I was working with in Cox's Bazaar, as soon as he started articulating a politics around what the aid world was doing to the Rohingya population, he was considered a militant in the in the Rakhine movement and um, lost his job with one of the NGOs, right? So the dangers and the risks to the other side of the power equation are much higher than they are on this side to challenge this, right? So when the title of the book was proposed um, and it was called Radicalizing Her in the West, it was immediately read as, oh no, you know, we're not offering any agency to this woman because 
these forces are radicalizing her, right? And so the white feminist understanding, you know, came back and said, no, you have to change the title, right? Because she doesn't have any power here. Rather than understanding that it is actually framed that way as a subversion of accountability. Your whole focus has been on her, what forces her to radicalize and her psycho-emotional state, um, whether she was raped or the context of her life, rather than the forces that she has no control over, right, around her that have pushed her into this positioning, right, the forces of militarization, the forces of, of supremacy, of ethnic domination, of, of violence, of patriarchy that you're responsible for, right? And so to keep the active verb in that sense, to force the accountability on you, no? So to me, that kind of, and there's so much there to explore. It's not like you're ever going to run out of things to look at, right? I mean, primarily the money. To me, I work with a lot of donors. And, you know, the reality is a lot of these, you know, if you critique sometimes a white feminist donor, people will say, well, aren't there other forces you should be critiquing? They're at least on the right side and this and that. No, because it is our job to critique power, isn't it? And in the spaces that I work, white feminist money has more power than the U.S. government, right, than the US a USAID, right, in the lives of the women that I work with. So I absolutely have a right to critique them. Many of these private foundations, we have no idea, no access to the politics that are driving them. It's usually one individual, right, one individual's belief in how one should save children or women or, you know, I mean, I've heard donors suggest everything from bringing trafficked women over to New Jersey so they can go to high school and have a normal prom, you know, to, and these are, these are very high powered individuals, right? So there's a lot to unpack, I think, in that space. Um, but in terms of sort of the more positive community building side of it, I think a lot of the work that has to be done is, is political education. I think that, um, you know, there's a project I'm working on now with Berkeley that's called the Legacies of Violence uh, Archive that's documenting violence in South Asia from a civilian perspective, and particularly a gendered one. And in doing this archival work, and you may see some of the boxes that, that build up behind me and in, in my consciousness all the time, are these photos of, you know, women in bell bottoms protesting at the White House or photos of or documents of the early NGOs inside the Tamil resistance movement are um, drafts of new constitutions, right? And that when you have access to this kind of history through political education, you're able to situate yourself in this struggle, right? That the resistance started long before you and will continue long after you. And particularly for younger activists and is to encourage them to find your role in the struggle, not to put so much effort on the performance of resistance, the performance of activism, the performance of, of engagement and humanitarian aid or whatever, but to figure out what your actual role is productively. In these spaces, um, we talk a lot about in my classes of, of citation practice, you know, who are you citing, who are you building your work on? Um, but, you know, at a different risk level, of course, the reality is that to rebel in these spaces, whether it's an NGO or the UN or the State Department, it's a kind of lonely endeavor. Right, and that one has to be ready for that isolation, that loneliness, um, but also to know that once you step outside and you are lonely for a while, all of a sudden there's like this magnetic force of these incredible women, you know, who who surround you, right? And but for me, women like the Pali and Kanisha Bond and Valeria and others who have created a new community of sort of resistance in different spaces that alleviate the loneliness, but also reinforce this challenge from the inside, right? So particularly for young women, I would urge you not to be, you know, sort of put off by the risks of, of rebellion in the West, right? They're not what they are in other countries. But to know that as soon as you make that first step, you are going to be held in community by other women. Thank you so much to Dipali and Nimi for such an honest reflection, both of your discomforts and your journeys and your words. I think this conversation, hopefully the next series of conversation will expand our political imagination, cultivate rebellion, build a community of res resistance. But as you both have said, you know, really sit with our discomfort and sit with the problems that we've created and how we can fix that. So thank you again. Um, we greatly appreciate your time.
and thank you to everyone.